ever feel like you're chasing after happiness only to have it disappear like a mirage you know it's so frustrating you're not alone though we're constantly bombarded with these messages about finding happiness but what if there's a better way a more fulfilling path mm, yeah i know what you mean today we're diving deep into this ancient greek concept eudaimonia okay and trust me it might just change how you think about living well it really is amazing how relevant this ancient wisdom still is today. Mm -hmm. You see, eudaimonia, it's not about chasing those fleeting moments of joy. Okay. The ancient Greeks, especially Aristotle, they saw it more as human flourishing. Interesting. Aligning your actions with your virtues to experience a deep sense of purpose and well-being. So it's not about those quick hits of happiness we chase after today, like, I don't know, getting the latest gadget or tons of likes on social media. Exactly. Those things, they might bring you some temporary pleasure, right? Yeah. But they don't necessarily lead to that lasting fulfillment. Eudaimonia, it's about cultivating a life of meaning and purpose Rah. driven by your values. This is already so interesting. So. How did the ancient Greeks think we could achieve this eudaimonia? We'll take the Stoics, for example. Okay. They believed that true happiness, it wasn't about external circumstances, but your response to them. Hmm, okay. They were big on living virtuously, practicing wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance to navigate all of life's ups and downs. So if I'm getting this right, it's about focusing on what we can control, like our reactions, our choices, instead of stressing over things we can't. Exactly. That sounds like, honestly, a lot less anxiety. It is. But now this doesn't mean we become, you know, robots. Right. Devoid of all emotions. Right. It's more about recognizing that we have the power to choose a wise and courageous response, no matter the situation. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I've always loved that Socrates quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. How does that fit into eudaimonia? You know that quote, that really captures the essence of it? Yeah. Eudaimonia requires self-reflection. It's about asking yourself those tough questions about your values. Like, wh like, what do you stand for? Are your actions reflecting what you actually believe? It's a call to live consciously, be present in your life, you know? So it's not enough to just say, oh yeah, honesty is important to me. I actually have to, you know, be honest in my everyday life, even when it's hard. Yes. It's about walking the walk, not just talking the talk. You got it. And it's not about being some, you know, perfect idealized version of yourself either. Aristotle, with his concept of the golden mean, argued for finding balance in all things. Okay. He believed true flourishing came from avoiding extremes and instead striving for that middle ground. Could you give an example of what that might look like for us today? Sure. Think about work-life balance. Okay. We're often pushed to be on constantly, yeah. hustle and grind all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. But eudaimonia, through this lens of the golden mean, would say, you know, find a sustainable rhythm, one that honors both your professional aspirations and your need for rest, connection, your personal pursuits. So it's about finding that sweet spot where you're going after your goals, but not burning yourself out. Yeah, exactly. That really resonates with me, especially with all the pressure to do it all. And, you know, that pressure often leads to seeking happiness in external validation or material things. Right. Eudaimonia. It's challenging us to look inward and ask, what truly brings me joy? What are my values and how can I actually live in alignment with them? It's so easy to get caught up in that, you know, seeking validation from outside sources, especially these days, it feels like it's everywhere. But what I'm hearing you say is that eudaimonia, it's almost like it gives you permission to define success and fulfillment on your own terms not by what society says you should be doing. Yes, exactly. It's such a powerful shift in perspective. It's about recognizing that your journey is unique and so is your definition of a flourishing life. There's no one size fits all here. Okay, I love that. But how do we even start to figure out what that looks like for us personally? You talked about values earlier. So how can someone really identify what their core values are? That is the question, isn't it? And it can be tough. It's often a journey of self-discovery, you know? You could start by thinking about those moments in your life when you felt truly happy, truly fulfilled and aligned with who you are. What were you doing in those moments? Who were you with? What values were present? It's like you're kind of connecting the dots, looking back to understand what made those moments so meaningful. Yeah, exactly. You can also ask yourself, what impact do you want to have? Yeah. The world, I mean, what kind of person do you want to be remembered as? Those questions can give you some clues about what you truly value deep down. What's really striking me here is that eudaimonia, it's not some passive thing. Like you don't just wake up one day and achieve it. It requires effort, you know? Consistent action, 
maybe even a little courage to challenge those societal norms we've all kind of absorbed. You're absolutely right. Living a eudaimonic life, it's not about reaching some finish line. It's about the journey of growth, self-reflection, constantly aligning your actions with your values as you understand them better over time. And that understanding can evolve, right? We don't have to have it all figured out perfectly from day one. Definitely not. In fact, those imperfections, those bumps in the road, those are essential. We learn and grow the most from our mistakes, mm. from those times when we maybe stray a bit from our values. Yeah, it makes sense. The key is to be kind to yourself. Learn from those experiences and then just recommit to aligning your actions with what you believe. It's encouraging to hear that setbacks aren't failures. They're just opportunities for growth to kind of course correct on this journey of eudaimonia. Exactly. And remember this, you don't have to do it all alone. Oh, that's interesting. The ancient Greeks, they knew how important community was for a flourishing life. How so? What did they say about that? Well, they recognized that we're social creatures. Our well-being is connected to others. Aristotle, he actually believed that true friendship, the kind based on mutual respect and virtue, was absolutely essential for eudaimonia. So being around people who lift you up, who inspire you, who share your values, who challenge you to grow, that all plays a part in cultivating this kind of flourishing life. A huge part. It's about building a support system. Mm. People who encourage you to be your best self. Mm. Think about the people you really admire, the ones who embody those virtues you want to cultivate in yourself. Mm, okay. Seek those people out, connect with them, have those deep conversations and learn from what they've been through. Yeah, it really makes you think about those important connections, doesn't it? Those people who you can really be yourself around, who push you to be better. It's not about going it alone, but finding those people you can really connect with, you know what I mean? It is, it's about recognizing that we're all connected mm -hmm. and that we can do so much more when we support each other, you know, uplift each other along the way. It feels like this whole idea of eudaimonia, it's almost like it's asking us to rethink what it means to live a good life, a fulfilling life, to move away from just chasing happiness for ourselves and towards something more connected, you know? more meaningful that's a really beautiful way to put it it's about understanding the true flourishing it's not just about you as an individual it's this balance you know between individual growth and these deep connections with others it's amazing to think about all these ideas they've been around for centuries right and yet they still feel so relevant today in the modern world i think it speaks to how much wisdom these philosophers had they really understood something fundamental about being human that desire for meaning, for purpose, for a connection with something bigger than yourself. It's like they've given us this incredible guide or roadmap to living a more fulfilling life. One that goes beyond just feeling happy in the moment and points us towards this deeper sense of purpose and well-being. And the best part, it's something anyone can strive for no matter where you come from, what your circumstances are. It starts with that first step of self-reflection, being willing to look at your life and ask those questions. What do I truly value? And how can I live in a way that's more true to that? And then, of course, it's about taking those insights and actually doing something with them. Day after day, little by little, making those choices that reflect what you believe in, even when it's hard, even when nobody's watching. And remembering that it's a process. It's not about being perfect. It's about progress. We're always learning and growing. And the journey of eudaimonia, it embraces that. It embraces those moments of learning and growth along the way. So as we wrap up this deep dive into eudaimonia, I'm curious if you had to choose just one thing, one principle from all of this ancient wisdom that we could all try to bring into our lives today, what would it be? That's a really great question. And on that note, I think we'll leave you with this. Just imagine for a second, a year from now, you've really taken these principles to heart. You've embraced eudaimonia. What would your life look like? What kind of person would you be? And what kind of impact would you be having on the world around you? It's such a powerful thought, isn't it? A beautiful reminder that trying to live a more fulfilling life I stay composed is a in the face of adversity. I don't expose, I gotta still resolve. I never retreat, I embrace the struggle, I won't accept defeat. Step up, step up. I keep my head high, never show despair. Step up, step up. I stay focused on my goals, on my ground, I'm aware. Step up, step up. I persevere through the pain and the strife. Step up, step up. Cause I'm a man of strength, I live a stoic life. I'm unbreakable, unshakable, yeah. Through the storms, I'm unbreakable, unshakable. I keep my mind steady, my heart cold is steady.
Like a stone, stoic principles in every verse I've known. Holes in my focus in the grind, I'm aware. In the face of challenge, I declare. Ooh, through pain and strife, I navigate. A stoic man in the world I cultivate. I wear my scars like badges of pride. Yeah. In the stoic rhythm, I let the beat guide. Yeah. Never showing despair, never taking a dive. In the stoic anthem, I thrive. I'm unbreakable. Unshakable, yeah. through the storms I'm unbreakable, unshakable I keep my mind steady, my heart cold as steel I'm unbreakable, unshakable, I know what's real A simple thank you is all that is necessary It would make everyone feel a lot better Of course, self-image manifests itself in the way we handle our personal lives you tell a youngster with a poor self-image that he ought to stay away from drugs, they'll kill you. And his response, at least internally, many times is, don't tell me that. My friends tell me that they make you feel good, make you feel big. Besides, suppose they're not good for me. What difference does it make? I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. Got nothing to lose. person with a good self-image would not respond in any such manner. You tell a youngster study for his lessons and obey the law if he's got a poor self-image, many times they're so negative they say it won't do me any good, you know, the deck's already stacked, I came the wrong side of the tracks, the rich kids are going to get all of their breaks, why shouldn't I have a little fun right now? You say to a youngster with a poor self-image, you really ought to save yourself for marriage, and their instant thinking is, who's going to marry me? What chance have I got? Why not I have a little fun now? That's what it's all about. My peer group tells me I've got to do these things to be accepted. Since I have nothing to lose, why not go ahead? An individual with a poor self-image is jealous without cause. Now, I'm not talking about jealousy for cause. Ladies, if he comes in smelling like joy and lipstick all over his collar, uh, jealousy is not a manifestation of a poor self-image. That has nothing to do with it. But some people say, you know, oh, I just love him so much I can't let him out of my sight. Or I just love her so much I don't want her out of my sight. What they're really saying is, I don't understand why this person married me. You'll ruin your life trying to make everyone happy. If you really want to know someone, Look at the five people they talk to the most and spend the most time with. While we wait for life, life passes. Seneca. Just because you know how it's done doesn't mean it's not magic. People are great at keeping secrets they don't know. You are not the mind or the body. You are the awareness that observes them. Nisargadatta Maharaj That logic is necessary. When one of those who were present said, Persuade me that logic is necessary, he replied, Do you wish me to prove this to you? The answer was, Yes then I must use a demonstrative form of speech. This was granted. How then will you know if I am cheating you by argument? The man was silent. Do you see, said Epictetus, that you yourself are admitting that logic is necessary? If without it, you cannot know so much as this, whether logic is necessary or not necessary. 
To think lightly of yourself and deeply of this world is an invitation out of your ego, out of your insecurities, out of what you think you cannot do. It is to look beyond your program. It is to think of your legacy. It is to think of what you will leave behind. It is to think of your contribution and your impact. Even in this moment, in the midst of trial, in the midst of tribulation, ask yourself the question, what can I contribute? You see, conflict is necessary. Trial is, is needed. It causes us to create, to be proactive, to be inventive. It moves us to become pioneers. What type of mark will you leave in the earth? What will be your legacy? Man has always been haunted by the vastness of eternity. And so we ask ourselves, when we are long gone, will our names remain? A man cannot understand the art he is studying if he only looks for the end result without taking the time to delve deeply into the reasoning of the study. Everything that you do, you need to ask yourself the question, why am I doing what I'm doing? See, everybody wants a ring, but nobody wants to practice. Practice makes progress. Practice brings us closer to the ring. Every time you get in that gym, every time you step on that field, every single moment that you study your craft and you become a man. Above all things, respect yourself. Inner peace begins the moment you choose not to allow another person or event to control your emotions. The only person you are destined to become is the person you decide to be. Ralph Waldo Emerson If you do not conquer self, you will be conquered by yourself. Having a weak body is a reflection of your broken mind. It is a reflection of your lack of willpower discipline, and your piss-poor life choices. Success is not what you have, but who you are. Jim Rohn What things we should exchange for other things. Keep this thought in readiness when you lose anything external what you acquire in place of it. And if it be worth more, never say, I have had a loss. Neither if you have got a horse in place of an ass, or an ox in place of a sheep, nor a good action in place of a bit of money, nor in place of idle talk such tranquility as befits a man, nor in place of lewd talk if you have acquired modesty. If you remember this, you will always maintain your character such as it ought to be. But if you do not, consider that the times of opportunity are perishing and that whatever pains you take about yourself, you are going to waste them all and overturn them. And it needs only a few things for the loss and overturning of all, namely a small deviation from reason. For the steerer of a ship to upset it, he has no need of the same means as he has need of for saving it. But if he turns it a little to the wind, it is lost. And if he does not do this purposely, but has been neglecting his duty a little, the ship is lost. Something of the kind happens in this case also. If you only fall to nodding a little, all that you have up to this time collected is gone. Attend therefore to the appearances of things and watch over them. For that which you have to preserve is no small matter but it is modesty and fidelity and constancy, freedom from the effects, a state of mind undisturbed, freedom from fear, tranquility, in a word, 
liberty. For what will you sell these things? See what is the value of the things which you will obtain in exchange for these. But shall I not obtain any such thing for it? See, and if you do in return, get that, see what you receive in place of it. I possess decency. He possesses a tribuneship. B possesses a praetorship. I possess modesty. But I do not make acclamations where it is not becoming. I will not stand up where I ought not. For I am free and a friend of God, and so I obey him willingly. But I must not claim anything else, neither body nor possession nor magistracy nor good report, nor in fact anything. For he does not allow me to claim them. For if he had chosen, he would have made them good for me. But he has not done so, and for this reason I cannot transgress his commands. Preserve that which is your own good in everything and as to every other thing as it is permitted, and so far as to behave consistently with reason in respect to them, content with this only. If you do not, you will be unfortunate, you will fall in all things, you will be hindered,